Good to see you all this morning. You guys had your coffee yet this morning? Well, that's good because we've all had lots of sugar, so we're ready to worship until we're purple. <laughs> all right, you guys stand up this morning, and let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody who's in this room. Uh, thank you for helping them get here through this uh, rather wet morning. And uh, we just thank you for uh, just all that you do, dear God, and just uh, prepare our hearts for a, for a good service and just for a great morning and a, overall a great day. We pray this in your name. Amen.
mighty. Amen. Isn't he great and mighty, everybody? Uh, you may be seated. Good morning. Great to see you all at the, you know, this beautiful sunny Florida day. Um, so, uh, before we get into the announcements, just so, uh, just to address the uh, category two elephant in the room, um, just, just so everyone knows, we are monitoring the storm. We've not made any decisions about Wednesday night services or weekly activities or anything at this time. But just keep an eye on your emails and our social media profiles. We'll be making announcements there. Um, just, like I said, keep an eye on those. Monitor that. We're watching the storm closely. We're just going to wait a little bit till it gets a little closer and we know what it's going to do before we make a decision. But just keep an eye on that, everybody. And that'll be coming soon. So, I guess. So, be in prayer about that as well. But <laughs> uh, Now, on your handouts, let's start on the back here. We have um, a couple of different ministries we're featuring on the back here. We have our Deliverance Addictions Ministry which meets on Monday nights. And if that is, um, if you or someone you know is struggling with an addiction in their lives, we'd love to invite you out to that. It'll be such a blessing and a help to them. There's been so many people who have gone through that program and have gotten help and have found freedom from their addictions. And so I want to encourage you to check that out. Uh, we also have our small groups um, here at Crossroads. And we have a ton of adult small groups. And I'm going to be honest with you. The best way to get connected at Crossroads is to get into a small group. Now, I know my small group has been such a blessing to my wife and I, and I want to encourage you. Uh, if you're not in a small group, check them out. Get involved in one. Find one that's a fit for you, and it'll be such a blessing and help you get more connected at Crossroads than you could imagine. So check those out. We have um, handouts for them at the Welcome Center as well as on our website. You can see a full list of our adult small groups. Then on the flip side of that, we have Walk Through Bethlehem. Walk Through Bethlehem is coming, and it's time to start recruiting for the actors. So if you're interested in acting in Walk Through Bethlehem, we have some of the roles we're looking for right on here. Um, you can fill that out and drop it in the offering box, or feel free to take it home. The script is available. Now you can go to crbible.com slash WTB, uh, Walk Through Bethlehem. Uh, there's a big button that says, click here to view the script. And so you can click that, see the script. Um, besides tour guide, all of them are less than a page. They're, you know, two minutes or less uh, for most of the parts. The tour guide one is very extensive. So if you like a challenge, that's the one for you. Um, but we do need all of these roles filled. We need all different. It, take, it, takes, a whole, it, take, it takes a city to make it work. And so um, we'd love to have you as part of this ministry. It's such a blessing. Um, every year to see how many people come through and how many people give their lives to Jesus because of this ministry. And we would love to have you as a part of it. Uh, then lastly, if it's your first time here with us, we are so glad that you're here. Make sure, if you haven't already, to stop by the welcome desk, uh, grab a bag. Um, it's full of goodies, just some odds and ends. It's our way of saying thank you for visiting with us today. Uh, and if you've already grabbed one, then please make sure um, after church, come meet us at the front or in the reception room, those double doors to your left over here. Uh, we'd love to get to meet you, put a face with a name, get to know who you are. And church, aren't you so excited to have our guests with us today? All right, at this time, I'm going to hand off the mic to Pastor Rich. All right, thank you so much, Pastor Cody. And today, we are having something very special that we're going to do here for a few minutes before we continue on with our regular service. And we're having a child dedication ceremony. And we understand the important role that parents play in raising their children. Amen? Amen? And while this dedication we're doing is not a biblical mandate, it's not something parents have to do, it's a, it's a time in which parents can choose to do this. And basically what they're choosing to do is dedicating themselves publicly before God and before you, our congregation, 
to raise up their children in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord. Amen? And, you know, isn't that a wonderful thing to do that? Let's give these parents and these families a hand that will be coming up here momentarily. So, again, they're making it publicly known before you, the congregation, of their intentions to do so. And us as a church, we make a commitment also during this dedication ceremony. And you might say, Pastor Rich, what's our commitment? Our commitment is to pray for these families and partner with them as they seek to raise their children according to the ways of the Lord. Now, this dedication ceremony that we're doing doesn't in any way predict the salvation of the children. Each child one day will have to make a decision for themselves to pray and receive Jesus as their Savior. But knowing that they have parents who are committed and who are dedicated to have their children in church and also teach them at home, we know that these children being dedicated today will have the greatest opportunity to be saved. Amen. Amen. Yes. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. So child dedication is a time for us to celebrate as well as thank God for these children. So today, uh, would you join me in welcoming the families that are participating in this ceremony today? And also thank you for those that have come today, family members, in support of them. So first, I'm going to call the Fadling family up. Let's welcome them to the platform. And if you all can come and stand over here to my right, that'd be wonderful. And they are dedicating today Felicity and Gabriel. Yes. Yes. Isn't that a beautiful family? And then next we have the Fisher family. So we'll ask the Fisher family to come on up here as well. Let's welcome the Fisher family. And you guys can come down here on this end. We have plenty of room for you. Wonderful. And the Fisher family, they are dedicating Juliet Bell. And then we have the Puha family. If you can go ahead and come on up. Let's welcome them. And we'll have you guys come on up, and you can go over and go on this side over here. There's a little more room on this side than that side. And they are dedicating Mason, Taya, and Trulani this morning to the Lord. And as we said, because parents are just see key role models for their children, we do ask parents to have a personal relationship with Jesus themselves as well as regularly attending church and most importantly, following after Christ in their lives. In Psalm 78, in verse 4, the Bible talks about parents, and parents are speaking. And what is written here in the Bible in Psalm 78, verse 4 says, We will not hide them, the teachings of the Bible, from the children, but will tell them the praises of the Lord and of His strength and the wonderful works that He has done, that they, the children, might come to know God, and they might set their hope in God and not forget his wonderful works. Amen? Amen. So now I'm going to ask the parents here today that are presenting their children publicly and dedicating them to the Lord to declare their intentions to do that. So parents, I'm going to ask you this question, and you can answer simply by saying we do. Parents, do you recognize that your children are a gift from the Lord and thank God and glorify him for his gift? And will you be faithful in praying for your child, bringing up your child in church, help teach them and set an, a godly example for them so that one day they might come to trust Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior? If so, please say, we do. We do. Amen. And at this time, church, our church congregation, like I said, during this ceremony, you have a role as well. And I'm going to ask our church congregation 
to show your support of these families and ask you this question. Will you offer your ongoing love and support prayers and encouragement to these parents as they seek to fulfill their calling and pray for these children that they one day will trust Jesus as their Savior? If so, will you answer, we do? Yes. Amen. Now, all together as a body of believers, let's go ahead and join together in prayer for these families right now. Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and the difference that he makes in our lives. We pray dearly for these families, particularly these parents, that they will be dedicated and committed unto you to be the godly examples for these children, that they might set their hope in God and they might trust in Jesus one day through you, through your word, and through the guidance of their parents. Lord, we thank you so much for their decision to publicly dedicate their children to you this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, we're going to keep these parents up here just for another minute because we have some special gifts that we'd like to give them. So I'm going to ask our Sunday morning children's director, Al, and his wife, Mandy, to come to the platform. Would you welcome them? So for, uh, for each of you, every family is going to get a bag, and in it is some gifts, uh, something for the parents, a book, uh, Dare to uh, Discipline, yeah, sorry, Dare to Discipline, and then uh, each child will receive a Bible, um, and then uh, there's also a small gift for the kids, looks like we got a little bunny, is that a rabbit? Yeah, it's a little bunny. Yeah, no, it's a lamb. Sorry, lamb. <laughs> so uh, also, uh, each child is going to receive a dedication certificate. Uh, has their name on it, as well as Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, so, yeah. If, as you uh, filter off, my wife will hand you your gift, and I'll give you your certificate. Thank you. All right, Al, I'll let you pass those out. Let's do this real quick. Let's get you all together. We want to get one group picture of all of you to celebrate this occasion. All righty. Wonderful. And then after this service, we're going to invite all of you to come afterwards, and we want to get some pictures of just your families by themselves. All right? Hey, church, let's go ahead and give them a hand one more time, and we're going to dismiss them because I'm sure they're going to want to drop their kids off next door. But let's all stand at this time, and let's welcome each other to the church. And if you happen to see one of these families, congratulate them this morning. All right, everybody, we are going to sing one more time before the message, and we are going to sing about the goodness of the Lord and the goodness of everything that he has brought for us. So if you guys could please stay standing, we're going to sing how good he has been to us. And all my life you have 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your goodness, God. We are so grateful for these families dedicating their babies to be raised up in your house, in your love, and in your will, God. Thank you for everything that you have done. You've been so, so good to us, Lord, and I pray that we may all not have any hindrances in being so grateful for everything that you have given us, Lord. Please fill Pastor Rich, Lord, with a new message that we may be willing to hear it and receive it, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. Amen. Isn't God good? Yes. Isn't God faithful? Yes. Well, you can run and try to hide, but you cannot outrun the goodness of God. (laughs) Amen. Hey, um, I just wanted to start off by just thanking our church family. Last Sunday afternoon, we sent out an email out to you as well as posted on social media on our Facebook and and Instagram pages about uh, a a really big need, and that is to help the hurricane victims. And uh, we had a very short window that we asked you to bring in supplies. I know some of you guys couldn't do that in that short window, which is understandable, but boy, boy, did you respond. And I just wanted to thank our church for doing that. You know, it was led by a couple of members in our church, Doug and Lindsay Meyerhoff and their family, George and Barbara, and, and uh, other members of our church. Um, and, and it was just, it blew my mind the amount of stuff that came in just in two days. <laughs> And uh, we're going to throw a picture up on the screen here, and that just gives you a glimpse of what was loaded into the truck, and the stuff kept coming and coming and coming. And I think we had one family in our church that donated 50, like 58 cases of water. (laughs) So again, let's give everybody, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing what you did on such short notice. And uh, what a blessing it's going to be to those that are receiving this in Douglas, Georgia. And that city has been devastated, and many of those people are displaced. So they're working with the mayor of that city, not only to deliver these supplies, but also to be able to cook and feed these families. They bought hot dogs and hamburgers and buns, and they're feeding people while they're up there as well. So thank you to our church for being such a blessing. And uh, now, uh, now that uh, we've moved from last week to this week, we see that there's another storm on the way. <laughs> and there's a hurricane that possibly that could be coming in our direction. We can see it. We've seen the models. We've seen the, the tracks. And we know, you know, there's the potential for it to possibly hit us. And for those of us that have lived in Florida, that's probably nothing new. Uh, has anybody in here been through a hurricane in Florida? Raise your hands. Okay, yeah, unless you're brand new to Florida or fairly new, you probably haven't. So we know about that. I remember as a kid, we've lived here in Florida in Wilbur-by-the-Sea, Port Orange, Daytona Beach area since I was a little kid. So I remember my first hurricane was Hurricane David. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. But I remember we all were sleeping together in one room, my entire family, and we could hear the winds blowing and and, uh, the earth shaking and... And uh, wait, that sounds like a Def Leppard song. Sorry, scratch that. Or, or is that ACDC? I don't remember. Anyway, no, forget that. Hey, that, was, that was the past. You know what they say? I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. They might be passed away, but they're still up here, right? <laughs> you still have the memories. But all things have become new. But I remember we were all together. We were sleeping, all of us in one room. And I had a big family. There were seven of us. And we were all in one room. And again, the windows were shaking. The house was quaking and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was terrified. And that was our first hurricane, Hurricane David. But since then, we've gone through so many more hurricanes that now we're at the point that we know how to prepare for a hurricane. You know, we know the essentials. We know that one of the first things you do is you go to the gas station because everybody's going to run out of fuel before you know it. We know that we have to get bottled water. We have to have batteries. You know, for some of you, it might be sandbags if you are in a low-lying area to prevent flooding. You know, for some of you, it's, it's getting ready to crank up that generator so that way you have some kind of power. So we know how to prepare for the things that we see coming, the physical things we see coming like a hurricane. But the question today is this, 
How do you prepare for the things that you can't see coming? How do you prepare for the spiritual, not the physical, but how do you prepare for the spiritual battles that you face today in life? And my message today is this. It is how to achieve success in the spiritual battles of life. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we are. If you can look with me at verse number 10, Ephesians 6, 10. The Bible says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness or spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And I'm not so sure that we always recognize this, but we are always engaged in spiritual warfare. The Bible says there's a being and his name is Satan. And his demons are doing all that they can to undermine the work of God in this world. They're doing all that they can to discourage you, the people of God. They're doing all they can to hinder the church, the body of Christ, to doing what we can do for the Lord. They're doing all that they can to see that we, the people of God, fail in our mission to live for God, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. They're doing all that they can to prevent you and I from reaching others for Christ, from being the testimony that we should be at school and at work, in your neighborhood, anywhere else. They're doing all that they can to prevent you from magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ and giving glory to God. But there's good news, and the good news is this. There can be victory over Satan. You might say, Pastor Rich, how is that possible? The Bible tells us how. The Bible tells us how we can achieve success in the spiritual battles in life. You do it first, your notes say, by recognizing who is the source of your strength. You see, if we're going to be victorious in the spiritual battles of life, we're going to need spiritual power. (laughs) And this verse tells us where it comes from. Look with me once again at verse number 10. It says, finally, my brothers, be strong in who? Be strong in the Lord. Our strength comes from Jesus. The word strong there means to be empowered. And this word strong was originally used to describe a patient that was near death, but they were recovering from an illness. And, and it was the picture, essentially, of a weak person being made strong. And that sounds like something we need. <laughs> because sometimes we're weak. And I'm not speaking of the physical sense. Sometimes we're weak when it comes to temptation. We're weak when it comes to sin. We can be weak when it comes to controlling our fleshly, sinful desires. And we all know what those are for us. And the strength that we need to walk in victory, the Bible says, in order for us to attain victory in the battles of life, the spiritual battles in life, the strength that we need comes from one true source, and that's Jesus. And that's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord. Lord. And that spiritual power can be yours through a relationship with Jesus. That means just as we trust Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, we say, we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that he died for our sins and he was buried and he rose from the grave. Just as we trust him for that, just as we trust him for his righteousness, so that one day when we leave this earth, we can enter into God's holy heaven, the Bible says that we need to exhibit that same kind of trust that enables us to have his power if we stand any chance against the attacks that we face in this life. Look at me once again at Ephesians 6.10. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. His might. His might. The Lord's might. 
Do y'all remember the cartoon character? This was from a long time ago. Cartoon character known as Mighty Mouse. <laughs> there he is. I know we have multi-generations in our church. We're so blessed. We have infants, the cradle to the grave in our church. <laughs> We're blessed with such diversity in our church. So those at the cradle age or up might not recognize Mighty Mouse you know, but we're not talking about, Ephesians 6 is not talking about a mighty mouse. It's not even talking about a mighty man like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> but Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about a mighty Lord. <laughs> a mighty Lord. And I love the chorus that we sang right before we, we did the child dedication. It said, great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Amen. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. And that mighty power that comes from the creator of the heavens and the earth, Paul writes, is available to us to achieve success in the spiritual battles that we face in life, when we face temptation, when we face sin in our lives. Well, how do we get this power? We get it simply by trusting in him and not ourselves. 2 Corinthians 1.9 is a great cross-reference if you want to jot that in your notes. It says that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. You see, that's the ultimate power is to bring someone that has died back to life. That's the ultimate power is to create something from nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You don't get any more power than that. You don't have any more might than that. But the Bible says that God has exhibited that power and he's shared his power with us. You see, all we need to do is this. We just have to stand against Satan in his, in his power, not our own power. If I try to stand against Satan and his attacks in my power, I will fail. But if I confess my weakness before God and I lean on the great and mighty Lord, then I become a candidate for victory. That's how it works. And one of the truths Paul's been teaching us in Ephesians is that when we're saved, we're made one with Jesus. Thus, his life becomes our life. His truth becomes our truth. Hopefully, his ways become your ways. His power can become your power. His strength becomes your strength. Because in your weakness, you're made strong through him. Ephesians 5.30 says this about us being in Christ. It says we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. But here is where we sometimes forget this very important truth from God's word. We forget about the power of the might of God and that he died on the cross for us. He conquered death through the resurrection and through that, he defeated Satan. Amen. Amen. What does that mean, Pastor Rich, for me? That means the war is already over. And Jesus has already won it. So in actuality, we're not fighting for victory. If we come to the place where we understand that Jesus has already defeated Satan, and you and I are in Jesus... We're partakers of his victory. And if we understand that truth, that will help us each and every day to walk in victory when we face the spiritual battles in our lives. Here's some great cross references if you want to jot that down from other verses in the Bible that tell us and reinforce the truth, not to trust in ourselves when you're facing spiritual battles in your life, but you trust in him who can give you those victories. It says here in Philippians chapter four, verse 13, let's say it together. I can do. You can do it through who? Christ. Great. Let's go to the next verse. 
2 Corinthians 2.14, let's say it together. Now thanks be unto God, We can triumph. We can have victory. In who? In Christ. Christ. Let's bring up the third verse. Let's say it together. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him. Who's the him? Christ. Amen. All of those verses, they come from different books of the Bible. I just gave you three verses. But all those verses have something in common. And they tell us who the source of our strength should be. And that is Jesus. Verse number 11. Ephesians 6. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of or the wiles of the devil. So how do we achieve success in the spiritual battles of life? Like we said, number one, you gotta recognize that Jesus is the source of your strength. Number two, by not falling for Satan's schemes. That verse that we just read identifies who our enemy is and how he works. We're told that our enemy is the devil. And we'll talk more about him later, but for now, let me just say this. He's the enemy of God, and he stands against everything that God stands for. And I know that the Bible says that we are to love our enemies, and we are to pray for our enemies, but I have a pretty good feeling that the Bible's not talking about the devil there. <laughs> I want to let you know that that doesn't apply, apply to him. We're not to love him. We're not to pray for him, but we're told here to stand against him. He's deceptive. He's devious. And he is experienced. You are no match for him. But he is. Why am I no match for him, Pastor Rich? Because he's been doing this for over 6,000 years, and he knows exactly what he's doing. He started with Adam and Eve. Satan wants to deceive you. I'm going to give you four ways to be alert in ways that Satan will try to deceive you if he hasn't already. The first one is this. It's in your notes. He tries to deceive us by lying to us about the consequences of sin. It's okay for you to sin. Well, what happens if I get caught? It's not going to be as bad as you think. All the examples I'm going to give you are from Genesis chapter 3, where he started this scheming with Adam and Eve, the first man and the woman. God told Adam and Eve that they had free reign over the entire Garden of Eden. They could do whatever they wanted. They could eat whatever they wanted, except, he said, for one thing. He said, out of all the trees in the garden, thou may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, God said, thou shalt surely die. That was God's command to them. The consequence of their sin was going to be death. They could have lived forever. But you know what Satan did? In Genesis chapter 3 verse 4, Satan disguised the serpent told Eve, you shall not surely die. <laughs> The second way Satan will convince you to do something contrary to God's word is he tries to deceive us by casting doubt on the word of God. He will tell you that, that a truth is a lie and he'll tell you that lies are truth. That's what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. After God had commanded them and told them through his word what they were allowed to do and that one thing that they were not allowed to do Satan, in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, said this. He said, you sh has God really said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Causing them to doubt God's word. Number three, another way Satan tries to deceive is by causing us to doubt, doubt God's goodness. I love that we just sang about God's goodness right before the message today. But Satan doesn't want you to think that God is good. 
Satan wants you to think that God is the one to blame for everything that's going on in your life and everything that's going on in the world. That's what Satan wants you to believe. And again, he did it with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 5. He was basically telling them that God is holding out on you. He's holding out on his goodness for you. And he told them specifically, he says, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, of that tree, its fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll be as God's. And then lastly, this is the fourth way that Satan tries to deceive you and me. He tries to deceive us by causing us to think that we can achieve victory on our own. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus as your savior today, if you've never prayed and you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and your life and forgive you of your sins so that way today you can be in Christ and live that victorious Christian life and for you to have that home in heaven in the future, Satan will convince you that you can't do it without him. But you also need to add additional things to him such as good works or thinking to yourself that you are good enough to get to heaven on your own. The Bible says there's no one good enough. No, not one. And that's why the only way that we can get to heaven is through the son. <laughs> Jesus was the only good one. But you see, that's what he did as well with Adam and Eve. When she saw the Bible says that when she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant and pleasing to her eyes and a tree that was desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and she did eat and she gave it to her husband with her and they did eat. Satan is our enemy. Satan tries to deceive us. And the Bible says the way that he does it is through schemes. Schemes is the word where we get methods. And basically those methods are like this, is that Satan can use what you listen to. Satan can use what you watch. Satan can even use people that you hang out with to deceive you, to lead you away from the Lord, and sometimes without you even realizing it. So what's the bottom line, Pastor Rich? 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober, be alert, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walketh about seeking who he may devour. Be alert, be aware. And sometimes, like you said, we don't even realize it. The Bible says Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. But the Bible doesn't just tell us that we need to stand against the schemes of the devil, but the Bible tells us how to do it. And that leads me to my last point here. And that is by putting on the whole armor of God. Back in Ephesians chapter six, look at me once again at the beginning of verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Verse number 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to resist in the evil day and having done all to stand. God has equipped us for the spiritual battles we face. And he's equipped us with something that is known as the armor of God. And the armor of God specifically lists six things that are listed in verses 14 through 17. And these pieces of armor are designed to protect you, the believer, from the attacks of the enemy. And next Sunday and next Wednesday, you are in for a treat. I cannot wait. This has been months in the making. But next Sunday morning and next Wednesday night in those two services, three services, we are having six young men in our church, ranging in age from like 20s and 30s, that are going to be preaching to you, our church, on the six pieces of the armor of God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to be here and support them because it will be a blessing to hear from each one of these men who are ministry leaders in our church or they're on staff at our church and they have this awesome opportunity to preach to you. I am looking so forward to it. But that's gonna be for next time. But here today, I just wanna focus on one word in verse 11 and one word in verse 13, and that's the word whole, W-H-O-L-E. It says, the whole armor of God we're supposed to put on. 
And it says that it's essential for us to do that if we're going to gain victory over the enemy. We can't just put on a few pieces and leave a few pieces off if we're going to achieve success. You know, every Saturday or a lot of the Saturdays, I, uh, I take my message before I preach it to you guys and I preach it to my wife. <laughs> so she actually gets to listen to my message three times. Can you believe that? And she's still here. Yeah. So I'm reading her my message and, you know, she's critiquing it. And as I'm reading her my message, you know, she's like, eh, that's no good. Take, take that out. Take that out. No, 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 no. And she's like, you know, so basically my point is this. Every Saturday, she rewrites half of my message. So it's kind of a combination of me and her, just so you guys know. Um, no, it's not that extreme. But I was telling her about this part about the whole armor of God. And she goes, you know, from her perspective, she gave me a great illustration. She said, you know, it's kind of like baking a cake. And I said, yeah, the whole armor of God, you've got to put on all the pieces of armor. If you're going to be successful, you can't leave this piece out and this piece off and this piece off. And she goes, yeah, that's like baking a cake. She said, you can bake a cake and you can leave out some ingredients, but you're not going to achieve success in the cake that you're trying to bake. <laughs> and I was like, can you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you can see it on my notes, right? All the, hand, all the handwritten stuff, that's her. I'm just kidding. Hey, so why do we do this? You know, why do we do this? Verse 11 says, why do we put on the armor of God? So that way we are able to stand. What word is the opposite of standing? Falling. Falling. So many last service says sitting. I guess so. I guess you could do that too. I guess that would be falling. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy falling. I fell roller skating Back when I was a kid, thankfully, I grew up in church, my, and uh, we went with our children's ministry and youth group to the old roller skating rink that was right here on the corner of Big Tree and Nova Road. I think it was called Skate City. Did anybody remember that? Okay. Yeah. Now it's, I think, a, a car museum. But we went skating there, and my best friend was skating with me, and I wasn't really good on my roller skates, and he grabbed my arm like I'm grabbing Cody's arm, and he was kind of, you know, going with me around the track, and both of us ended up going face forward, and I split my chin wide open. I fell, and it was so gory, I'm not even going to tell you about it, because I know lunch is coming up, but it was disgusting. You can see bone. It was like really, really bad. <laughs> She's like, stop it. And I had to have a lot of stitches in order to seal that, that up. And it all happened because of a fall. And maybe you've had a bad fall like that. I know some of you have fallen off bikes. I know because you've told me. <laughs> and and I, I also know of an AC repairman who was up in the ceiling that fell through the ceiling onto a desk. Falling isn't fun. We recently hired a lawn company to cut our grass and the, uh, the guy was out there with his weed whacker and he was doing the last bit of trimming and as he was weed whacking, he was walking backwards and doing this. And as he was walking backwards with his weed trimmer, I'm looking out the window at him and then the next thing I know, he backs up right into the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> weed whacker and all. And he was out of the pool as fast as he went in the pool. <laughs> It was like, ah! I was like, whoa, electrocution. Or was it, I guess it was, no, it was gas powered. But anyway, my, my point is this, you know, that had to hurt. My point is this, falling isn't fun. But here's my point. My point is that not all falling is physical. Falling has another definition. Everything seems to be going so well in your life. You're abiding in Christ. You're following his word to the best that you can. You're living the Christian life. You're sharing your faith. You're being an awesome witness for the Lord at your school, at your job, in your neighborhood. And then you give in to one of Satan's schemes and you fall. But I want to let you know, even when you fall, you can still get back you can still get back up. Reminds me of that commercial years and years ago about that lady. What did she say? <laughs> it's the opposite of that. 
you can get back up, even though we're susceptible to fall. But my point is this, we don't have to fall. We can stand. Your notes say through the Lord and what he provides, he is able to make you stand. He makes you able to stand. And that word stand is a military term. It, it means to hold a critical position during a time of enemy attack. It's a picture of a soldier that's refusing to yield even once one inch of ground to an attacking foe. So there's a photo I want to show you. And the photo I want to show you is this. It's not the image of someone that's on the offensive, but it's a picture of someone that's on the defensive, protecting the ground that's already been won. For us, it means that our enemy, the devil, seeks to take away from you what you've already been given. You've got to understand that he wants your testimony. He wants your marriages. He wants your children. He wants everything that God has given you. But God is able through his power to enable us to stand against the attacks of Satan. And the matter of standing is illustrated even by our Lord Jesus Christ. What he was facing the attacks of Satan himself recorded for us in one part of scripture, Matthew 4. It said the devil kept attacking him and attacking him and attacking him. And while the Satan was on the offensive, Jesus was on the defensive. And Jesus steer, just merely stood on the word of God. And when he did, what did Satan do? Flee. Verse number 12. We'll finish up. Verse 12 says, For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Our enemy is never another human being. It's not our boss. It's not our parents. It's not our neighbor. It's not even our spouse. <laughs> People can hurt us. People lie to us. People are mean to us. People can do us wrong. But that doesn't make them the enemy. They might be doing the work of the enemy, but they're not the enemy. When other human beings act this way against us, we have two choices. We can become angry, hold a grudge, exact revenge against them, try to get even, or secondly, we for can forgive them and just move on. So the enemy is never another human being. Remember that. That's why that verse is in the Bible to remind us of that. One of the greatest tricks the devil will do is focus your attention on other people and what they do to you. He uses them to distract us from seeing who the real enemy is. And he does it to help prevent us from walking with the Lord. So when we take that bait that Satan has out there for you, when we take the bait and we focus our attention on what people do, we lose sight of Jesus and we lose sight of what God's will is for us in our lives, in our homes, at work, at school, and every place else. When we fight against one another, we shed that armor of God because we're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. But I want to leave you with this thought. Remember this, always remember this. Satan is, according to the scripture, he might be the God of this world, but he must bow before the God of this universe. And the God of this universe is on your side if you're a believer in Jesus. And if God be for us, who can be against us? You're on the winning team. Amen. God can give you that victory in your life. So how do we defeat an enemy like Satan? How do we win battles of things that we can't see? You know, we can see that hurricane coming and we know how to prepare for that. The water, the batteries, the fuel, sandbags. But sometimes we don't see the spiritual attacks are coming. But the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God 
that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember, you're no match for the devil. I'm no match for the devil. You're no match for his demons. But Jesus is. And when you stand in him, he will equip you to stand. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't do it on your own. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed here this morning, maybe you're here today. And my question for you is this, are you in him? Are you in Christ? If you're not in Christ, the good news is that you can be. God loves you. And God would love to have a relationship with you through his son, Jesus. Jesus will be with you each day, each step of the way. But you've got to initiate that relationship with him. The Bible says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he died for your sins and rose from the grave. You see, if you don't know Jesus today, you can come to him. That's all you need to do is just come to him. Come and see us after the service today up front or in the reception room. We'll be glad to talk with you and show you and pray with you. Last week, we had two people, two different people that came forward that said, I want to be in Christ. I need that relationship with God in my life. And they prayed and received Jesus as their Savior. So if that's you, would you come to him this morning? If you know Jesus, make sure you're standing in his power and make sure that you're fighting the right enemies. If you need help in the spiritual battles of life, know who the source of your strength is. It's Jesus. And if you need to come to Christ, I invite you to do that after the service today. Remember, he will enable you to stand. Lord Jesus, thank you for this message today. Your word is so relevant and so profitable to our lives, even today, 2,000 plus years after this was written. Thank you for loving us and always being there for us and giving us the strength and the might that we need to achieve success in the spiritual battles that we face in life. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let Jesus be your firm foundation. Let's stand and let's sing that together before we leave this morning.
on, sing it out. He won't fail. He won't fail. No, he won't. Hey, man, what a great message today. You know, hearing Pastor Rich mention Def Leppard, it brings to mind that old song, Rock of Ages. And for us, that's Jesus. He is the Rock of Ages. He's still rolling. He has the power, and he gets the glory. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. Thank you for such a great day. Thank you for such a great message. Lord, thank you that you are stronger than any storm that comes our way. Any hurricane that comes, you are so much bigger than that. So just thank you for being the firm foundation that we stand on. Lord, I pray for safety as we go into this week. I just pray that you would protect us all and that you would help us put on the whole armor of God each and every morning. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for it all, dear Jesus. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.